Moby Dick, by Herman Melville. Chapter 78. Cistern in Buckets. Nimble as a cat, Tashtago mounts aloft, and without altering his erect posture, runs straight out upon the overhanging main yard arm, to the part where it exactly projects over the hoisted ton. He has carried with him a light tackle called a whip, consisting of only two parts, traveling through a single sheaf block. Securing this block, so that it hangs down from the yard arm, he swings one end of the rope, till it is caught and firmly held by a hand on deck. Then, hand over hand, down the other part, the Indian drops through the air, till dexterously he lands on the summit of the head. There, still high elevated above the rest of the company, to whom he vivaciously cries, he seems some Turkish muezzin calling the good people to prayers from the top of a tower. A short-handled sharp spade being sent up to him, he diligently searches for the proper place to begin breaking into the ton. In this business he proceeds very heedfully, like a treasure hunter in some old house, sounding the walls to find where the gold is masoned in. By the time this cautious search is over, a stout iron-bound bucket, precisely like a well bucket, has been attached to one end of the whip, while the other end, being stretched across the deck, is there held by two or three alert hands. These last now hoist the bucket within grasp of the Indian, to whom another person has reached up a very long pole. Inserting this pole into the bucket, Tashtago downward guides the bucket into the ton, till it entirely disappears, then giving a word to the seaman at the whip. Up comes the bucket again, all bubbling like a dairy maid's pail of new milk. Carefully lowered from its height, the full freighted vessel is caught by an appointed hand, and quickly emptied into a large tub. Then remounting aloft, it again goes through the same round until the deep cistern will yield no more. Towards the end, Tashtago has to ram his long pole harder and harder, and deeper and deeper into the ton, until some twenty feet of the pole have gone down. Now, the people of the Pequod had been bailing some time in this way. Several tubs had been filled with the fragrant sperm, when all at once a queer accident happened. Whether it was that Tashko, that wild Indian, was so heedless and reckless as to let go for a moment his one-handed hold on the great cable tackles suspending the head, or whether the place where he stood was so treacherous and oozy, or whether the evil one himself would have it to fall out so, without stating his particular reasons. How it was exactly, there is no telling now, but, on a sudden, as the eightieth or ninetieth bucket came suckingly up, my God! Poor Tashtago, like the twin reciprocating bucket in a veritable well, dropped head foremost down into this great ton of Heidelberg, and with the horrible oily gurgling, went clean out of sight. Man overboard! cried Daggu, who amid the general consternation first came to his senses. Swing the bucket this way, and putting one foot into it, so as the better to secure his slippery hand hold on the whip itself, the hoisters ran him high up to the top of the head, almost before Tashtago could have reached its interior bottom. Meantime, there was a terrible tumult. Looking over the side, they saw the before lifeless head throbbing and heaving just below the surface of the sea, as if that moment seized with some momentous idea, whereas it was only the poor Indian unconsciously revealing by those struggles the perilous depth to which he had sunk. At this instant, while Daggu, on the summit of the head, was clearing the whip, which had somehow got foul of the great cutting tackles, a sharp cracking noise was heard, and to the unspeakable horror of all, one of the two enormous hooks suspending the head tore out, and with a vast vibration the enormous mass sideways swung, till the drunk ship reeled and shook as if smitten by an iceberg. The one remaining hook, upon which the entire strain now depended, seemed every instant to be on the point of giving way, an event still more likely from the violent motions of the head. Come down, come down, yelled the seaman to Daggu, but with one hand holding on to the heavy tackles, so that if the head should drop, he would still remain suspended, the negro having cleared a foul line, rammed down the bucket into the now collapsed well meaning that the buried harpal should grasp it, 
and so be hoisted out. In heaven's name, man, cried Stubb, are you ramming home a cartridge there? A vest. How will that help him? Jamming that iron-bound bucket on top of his head. A vest, will ye? Stand clear of the tackle, cried a voice like the bursting of a rocket. Almost in the same instant, with the thunder boom, the enormous mass dropped into the sea, like Niagara's table rock into the whirlpool, the suddenly relieved hull rolled away from it, too far down her glittering copper, and all caught their breath, as half swinging, now over the sailors' heads, and now over the water. Dagu, through a thick mist of spray, was dimly beheld clinging to the pendulous tackles, while poor, buried alive Tashtago was sinking utterly down to the bottom of the sea. But hardly had the blinding vapor cleared away, when a naked figure with a boarding sword in his hand, was for one swift moment seen hovering over the bulwarks. The next, a loud splash announced that my brave Gweekeg had dived to the rescue. One packed rush was made to the side, and every eye counted every ripple, as moment followed moment, and no sign of either the sinker or the diver could be seen. Some hands now jumped into a boat alongside, and pushed a little off from the ship. Ha! Ha! cried Dad Goo, all at once, from his now quiet, swinging perch overhead, and looking further off from the side, we saw an arm thrust upright from the blue waves, a sight strange to see, as an arm thrust forth from the grass over a grave. Both! Both! It is both! cried Dagu again with a joyful shout, and soon after, Queekeg was seen boldly striking out with one hand, and with the other clutching the long hair of the Indian. Drawn into the waiting boat, they were quickly brought to the deck, but Tashtago was long in coming to, and Gweekeg did not look very brisk. Now, how had this noble rescue been accomplished? Why, diving after the slowly descending head, Gweekeg with his keen sword had made sigh lunges near its bottom, so as to scuttle a large hole there, then dropping his sword, had thrust his long arm far inwards and upwards and so hauled out poor Tash by the head. He averred, that upon first thrusting in for him, a leg was presented, but well knowing that it was not as it ought to be, and might occasion great trouble. He had thrust back the leg, and by a dexterous heave and toss, had wrought a somerset upon the Indian, so that with the next trial, he came forth in the good old way. Head foremost. As for the great head itself, that was doing as well as could be expected. And thus, through the courage and great skill and obstetrics of Quiqueg, the deliverance, or rather, delivery of Tashtago, was successfully accomplished, in the teeth, too, of the most untoward and apparently hopeless impediments, which is a lesson by no means to be forgotten. Midwifery should be taught in the same course with fencing and boxing, riding and rolling. I know that this queer adventure of the gay headers will be sure to seem incredible to some landsmen, though they themselves may have either seen or heard of some one's falling into a cistern ashore, an accident which not seldom happens, and with much less reason too than the Indians, considering the exceeding slipperiness of the curb of the sperm whale's well. But, for adventure, it may be sagaciously urged, how is this? We thought that tis sued. Infiltrated head of the sperm whale, was the lightest and most corky part about him, and yet thou maca it sink in an element of a far greater specific gravity than itself. We have thee there. Not at all, but I have ye, for at the time poor Tash fell in, the case had been nearly emptied of its lighter contents, leaving little but the dense tendinous wall of the well. A double welded, hammered substance, as I have before said much heavier than the sea water, and a lump of which sinks in it like lead almost. But the tendency to rapid sinking in this substance was in the present instance materially counteracted by the other parts of the head remaining undetached from it, so that it sank very slowly and deliberately indeed, affording Gweekeg a fair chance for performing his agile obstetrics on the run, as you may say. Yes, it was a running delivery, so it was. Now, 
Had Tashtago perished in that head, it had been a very precious perishing, smothered in the very wittest and daintiest of fragrant spermasti, coffined, hearsed, and tombed in the secret inner chamber and sanctum sanctorum of the whale. Only one sweeter end can readily be recalled. The delicious death of an Ohio honey hunter, who seeking honey in the crotch of a hollow tree, found such exceeding store of it, that leaning too far over, it sucked him in, so that he died embalmed. How many, think ye, have likewise fallen into Plato's honey head, and sweetly perished there?